Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Growing up great with science, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the PNC Foundation, which receives its principal funding from the PNC Financial Services Group. PNC supports early childhood education through PNC Grow Up Great, a $350 million multi-year initiative that began in 2004 to help prepare children from birth to age five for success in school and life. Fedway Associates, Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey and by PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Welcome to Caucus New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. American children are in fact lagging behind in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. But many institutions are committed to changing this starting at the preschool age. Here in the studio to talk about this very important, top, important topic are Dan Minnelli, Vice President of STEM Education at the Liberty Science Center. Jeanette Betancourt, who was on one-on-one -on -one with us, is right here for Caucus, the Senior Vice President for Outreach and Educational Practices at Sesame Workshop. Janice Chapman, pre-K teacher at the DA Quarles Early Learning Childhood Center. And finally, Anthony Gardner, Executive Director, New Jersey State Museum. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to let you know that there'll be websites up for all of these not-for-profit organizations throughout this program. Log on to those sites, get more information. We can only go so far on the television end. It's your job to go out there and get more information. Those websites are great. Listen, we were talking about science before we got on the air, and one of the things that keeps coming up is that when you talk about growing up great with science, you were on one-on-one -on -one -on -one with us. Mm -hmm. You believe deeply that children, particularly at a younger age, are naturally born, naturally born scientists. Correct. Mm -hmm. Natural born scientists. Is that true? It is true. Make the case. You can, I'll make the case by saying that there, you watch a young child, their curiosity, you find that they're constantly asking questions about their environment, about what they're experiencing. That is science. That is the exploration of science, wanting to know the where's, the why's, the how's. And uh, every child has that. And our role is to try to foster that further. And you do that with Sesame Workshop? We do that with Sesame Workshop, as well as many of the organizations here. We're going to show a little bit of video later on about one of the great initiatives mm -hmm. you're involved in. Make the case, how early on can you begin this project? Well, this we initiative? start at four years old. and. Uh, um, I basically wasn't a science person. I was an art major. And then I got a master's in elementary education and early childhood, and then got a master's in curriculum, another one in curriculum development. I was an artist. And why I went into elementary education was because all the things that an artist is would only help children. Innovation, fluency, um, creativity. So what I would do with the art was not take the painting part of it, but the creative aspect of it, and devise behavioral strategies, learning components, and how to enrich learning, all learning, not just the art components. Right. So, and it's going to bring us to a couple of conclusions, which is number one, STEM education is important because of the inquiry skills, which you were just re referring to. Again, based on inquiry-based learning, which involves as you just said, uh, looking for information, disseminating information, asking the whys and the hows, which is basically mm -hmm. art, but just in a different way. At four, they're new. They're innocent. If I've taught uh, first, second. I've taught all over. But at pre-K and four, are it they ready? Begins. They are ready. They're ready. They are <clears throat> so ready. Well, let me ask you. This is interesting. STEM has been used, the, the acronym STEM has been used several times. What is it? Science, technology, engineering, and math. OK. We are behind. What does that mean? Well, on international comparisons, what they do is they have a series of indicators that they measure our performance against other countries. And they rank them annually with studies called uh, 
Tim's and PISA performance. Oh, great, more acronyms. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. But in, in long story short, is they compare. Part of the problem with science and math is that we have so many acronyms. <laughs> but go ahead. But you know, it's not a perfect science measuring the proficiency of, of certain countries, but it's getting better. And we are learning more about how students learn. And luckily, in nationally, with this new movement called the Next Generation Science Standards, they're really thinking earnestly about retooling the way we teach science. Has it's the paradigm moment. shifted? Has it changed, and when did that happen in, in this country? Go well, ahead. I think the overall learning landscape is changing. And museums, I could speak from that perspective, are now really positioned to serve a vital role in that new learning landscape. And at the New Jersey State Museum and Planetarium, we're serving preschoolers and K through 12 audiences and beyond through these kinds of uh, educational opportunities. But around um, STEM, certainly, I mean, it, it basically is a major emphasis for a number of organizations out there. And as a museum, we become this place where you know, museums are places of discovery. Mm. And we talk about uh, capturing young people's attention at an early age around the STEM fields. You could do that in a museum very easily because we have everything we do is object-based learning. What does object-based learning mean? So object-based learning, you take, you take an artifact and you use that artifact to connect someone to either concepts about that artifact. For example? For example, we have a, a PNC-supported program called uh, Spending, Sharing, and Saving. And the centerpiece of this program, we show this video. It's a Sesame Workshop video. What's it called? Uh, spending, Sharing, and Saving. Got it. Uh, grow up great. And we show this video, which has basically Elmo setting out on a journey to where, through, where he wants to buy this stupendous ball. And he learns about the concepts of saving money, spending money, and sharing. Well, hold on there, because a lot of that's math. And by the way, in part two of this Grow Up Great initiative, we're going to be talking about the math piece, uh, which right. has to do with math. Which right, you're but right I, I, wanted, I wanted to answer your question about object-based okay, learning. Okay, good. So we take that video. And then when the video is done, we take the children through our ethnographic ga uh, gallery. And we take them over to a, a bowl used by the Delaware Indians. Right. And we talk to the students about the bowl. And we ask them to just first, first part of, of um, object-based learning, describe, describe this artifact, this object. What do you think it is? What does it look like? What is it made of? What would you use it for? And so object-based learning, it's, it's almost preparing them to be scientists because they're engaging in that process of discovery. Not too complex for small children. Not at all. No, I've seen them firsthand. I mean, it really resonates with them. And they learn, young people learn to read objects sometimes even before they learn to read words in a book. Speaking of videos, I'm about to set up this video. Help us on this, uh, Jeanette. One World, One Sky, what is it? Oh, it's a wonderful way that Sesame Workshop was able to bring two things, the exploration of astronomy, learning the sky and the world around us and what it's made up of, but also the secret element that even though we all are exploring it from a science point of view, we all also around the world share the same sky. This is produced by Sesame Workshop. This is produced with the facilitation of the National Science Foundation and also support from PNC. But, but, but here's the thing I'm thinking about. Yes. Who's it for? Like, as we get ready to watch this, is it geared toward a certain age? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's younger children. And it was meant to bring these concepts down to this age-appropriate way. And we're all describing here these very visual and hands-on way of learning about complex topics. Is it three and four, the ages? It, this goes all the way from two to actually eight. Okay. Our daughter Olivia is two and a half, so I'm just picturing this right now. Yes. Okay. Uh, one world, one, one sky. sky, produced by the Sesame Workshop. Let's go to the videotape, and we'll talk about it after that. Thank you. Let me show you another picture I know. It's made from these seven stars. Count them with me, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And when you connect them, it looks like a big spoon you dip into a pot of soup. So this group of stars is called the Big Dipper. Got it? Because it looks like a big spoon in the sky. Um, let me ask you about that. Big Bird yes. as the star of it. Mm -hmm. How important is it that it's Big Bird? I think it was Big Bird because he's able to explain concepts so easily. 
and also the fact that he shares, he represents in a way how characters on Sesame Street come together. And he's always a facilitator. So what he's showing you is the scientific concept about a dipper, you know, and at the same time also showing you that, that what you're watching, you watch all around the world. So whether you're in China, because it's a whole segment here in China, or here in the U.S., you're watching the same sky. Now, I'm curious about something else, and I'd like it help me on this. We were talking about this before we got on the air. Um, our boys are, are, are 8 and 10, and they're fascinated by a lot of the questions you're talking about. And as I said, our daughter's younger. But for, for kids at certain ages, is it different teaching science for children who are 8 and 10 in this context? Um, and I was saying that there's a science fair coming up in town, and, and the question is this. For kids who may not have gotten it, at the younger age, who may not have gotten the science bug or have connected to it the way you just described. Is it harder to play catch up at eight and 10? Is it harder? No, I caught up at 40 something. <laughs> not at all. But that was you, you had a gift. No, 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 it's out there. It's out there and I think, I was listening to your previous show about good teachers. Yeah, we had four terrific it's teachers. Phenomenal. But it's, it's like buying a piece of property and you have oil on it. You know the oil's there. It's been there all the time. You need the resources, you need right. the tools and the ingenuity to, to pump and drill and then whoosh, it spews. That's there's right. your science and there's your magic. And that's what it's you can in do. There? It's in there. What it's the, all around. What is, what is the it? It's there. It's the way of looking at things. It's the way it's seeing things. You talk about object. Um, we did, one of your people brought in a banana and we were sitting around. We're, Yes, she brought the banana in? What are we going to do about the banana? And we're, you know, you got a lot of reluctance, the crossed arms. <laughs> Let's take a look at this banana. And of course, me, what do you think? Well, it's beautiful, it's shape, blah, blah, blah. And then from that banana, we had a 45 minute discussion on the banana, mm -hmm. the shape, the texture, then we open it up and, and relating it to this. Just to think what you can do with children. And these were, it's, it's limitless, it's there. It, it, you, you have to figure out, and you maybe you can be more versed on this. I can do it in the classroom very, very well. I didn't know I could do it, but <laughs> once you I You see the possibilities immediately. Unbelievably. Talk well, to it. I'm happy to hear that an informal scientist can come into a classroom. Informal science is all the science that happens outside of your classroom, essentially. Mm -hmm. I, I love to hear that a member of my team has come in with something, an object like a banana, and asked the kids and their teacher together to take a look below the surface, find the, sur the science, and really everything you handle every day. Mm -hmm. But the eight and 10 year old question, that's, that's new to me, and I taught for 25 years science. And Talk about your background before you came to I was a science, science teacher in public school, international schools in, in New York City and in, in France. And that comment about the 8 and 10 year olds already struggling and, and not having it yet and not feeling confident in their, their what we call foundational understandings, I used to hear that with 13, 14 year olds. And it, it's a little troubling to me to hear that younger people, because the reason I specialized with, in the early adolescent when I taught science was because there was still that sense of wonder. When you're talking about your four-year-olds, they're, they're really fearless thinkers. They're willing fearless to take, thinkers. Yeah, they're willing to take risks and they're thinking, and they're not so afraid of making a mistake. But when I hear about your boys at and eight by and the way, ten. It's not, it's not really our boys. It's a lot of kids well, at the same age. The so pipeline has shifted back, they say, yeah. They say that now the expectations feel higher and science can feel more abstract earlier in life, whereas there was this window of opportunity we used to have with kids up through middle school where you could get them coming to a science fair project and yes. saying something like, I want to build a perpetual motion machine. And then looking at all the hidden variables and finding, oh gosh, there's all this other science that I need to look at more carefully. But to hear younger kids saying, oh gosh, I have to do this project. It has to and have I a right And I want to get answer. an A, and I'm intimidated, so I won't do that project. Let me just play this out. So here's my fear. Forget about our kids. I'm talking about any kid, any child, who's intimidated by it, and then who has a parent who's intimidated by it. The parent wants the kid to get a good age, excuse me, a good grade, to grow up great as they perceive growing up great, getting a good grade, which may or not be the way we define or should be defining growing up great. But think about this for a second. And so the child doesn't explore, is not a fearless learner, takes the safe road, which doesn't seem to be the way science, great science mm -hmm. gets played out. And my concern here is that that road is not the one we should have our kids on. Does it make any sense to you? That they don't take the risk. Well, I, I think there and is. And the parents don't know what to do. There, there certainly is an, an issue around comfort level with parents. And that's why the preschool that programming is so important. too. 
because the programming that we're providing to these students is just as much about it educating the parents as well, giving them activities to do in, in the home. Yes. Uh, Grow Up Great is such a wonderful program because you can go and you could, they turn taking a visit to the park and turn it into a science lesson. There's simple things you could do in, and it's, in encouraging that. Yes, yeah, stay on that for a second. Simple visit to the moment. park. How is that a science lesson? Well, keep in mind, when we're talking about STEM, I think we, we tend to think of this complexity. Yes. But before you actually broke it down, and you said something, Steve, you said that's, that's math. But STEM is keeping in mind these, these four really interesting words, science. And when you look at science, it's the properties of matter. It's how, you know, what they're made of, how they're made of, right. and things like that. Then there's technology. And when you think of technology, they're tools. Mm. So your computer is a tool, your right. pen is a tool. We can relate to all that. Right? Engineering is how you put things together, how they come together. So far, all so right? good. Math, we've talked a lot about math. You know, it's patterns, it's numbers, it's mm -hmm. shapes, it's all of these. Mm -hmm. That's what STEM is. And if you look at all those concepts and you sort of pull away from the complexity of the term, but look at the concepts underneath, they're really experiences that from a very young child all the way as we into middle school and above, you experience on a daily basis. You know property, you know that there's a difference between the way that the composition of this table, the wood versus the glass. Right. All right. You know that we, in order to make this show happen, there were tools that are being. This matured. show is a product of STEM. Correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know what I hear you saying? They, I don't believe any one of you accepts a young person in the spirit of wanting all the young people to grow up great. A young person saying, or a ch or a parent saying about their child, he or she. They're not great. They're not. They're not scientifically inclined. I don't believe any one of you accepts that. Because of the way you just described it, mm -hmm. that definition of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, that is relatable on any level to any child. And it's, to it's, any adult also. And to any adult, mm -hmm. because the, the parent mm -hmm. who wants to be helpful says, I can't, I even said this myself on the Science Fair project. I thought, I, I actually said, I don't think I could be very helpful because I'm more of a communications person, that's not my thing. And I'm embarrassed because I was getting ready for this show. Mm -hmm. I'm just being totally candid here. Mm -hmm. I never did that well. I never did that great in science. But is, is it the way we look at science that could be part of the problem? I think it is. I think it's, it's getting more complex. You say that word again? I think it's intimidating to some people. Yeah. And I think what you And the challenge too. that the country faces. Right. And what impact does it have on children? If we as parents, if we are intimidated mm -hmm. by science as parents, that has implications for our children. Absolutely. Because right? then we're not setting our children. We don't feel as much as ease as parents. And, and again, thinking back, I can't do it. And if I can't do it, I'm not comfortable. But we know that in speaking in this manner and also the experiences that everyone's laying out here, it's really what you're saying yeah. is making it hands-on. And it doesn't matter at what age because that's the remarkable aspect of science. Yeah. It's really hands-on exploration. And mistakes are part of it. Absolutely. It's the best approach to learning. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> yeah. so that's what happens when you're in a classroom. Go ahead. I'm raising my hands. Process versus product. You are afraid of the product. How am I going to look? How is my child going to look compared to? Forget the product. Forget what you came out with. Do panel boards. Mm -hmm. This is what we are doing. Show a panel. This is the beginning. This is how we started. Blah, 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 blah. Stage two. Blah, 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 blah. From this, we've escalated to this, this, and this. And include the mistakes? Oh, obviously, it's learning. That's part you of divide. science. Yes, science. Then you do the next panel, the next panel. What do we derive upon? We don't know yet. <laughs> well, that's good because it's a work in art. It's a work in progress. I wish it could be... Uh, listen, this is not at all about our children. It's about the way we communicate and talk about this. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if we talked about this more in terms of process and less product. Well, because if we were less obsessed with the grade and more obsessed with the process and the learning of it, I feel like it would be a healthier discussion. Help me on this. Well, STEM, 
the acronym and the idea is opening up this conversation. And there's a lot of op optimism about this right now. Earlier in the conversation, when you said you know, they want to get the A, they want to get it right, it speaks to the motivation. Are you, are you extrinsically motivated by something that if there's fear of failing or sure. producing something that you're really interested in, you really care about, you're going to learn about organically? Right. So on the time we have left, I'm curious about this. You know, I, America behind, okay, fine. What, uh, what did other, what other countries seem to be looking at this in a healthier way and with their children, I'm not going to say growing, I'm not going to say growing up greater than our children, but who's doing this really well? Finland. I, it's in Finland. Finland. Yeah. Yeah. Finland, it's yeah. a very robust model where they train their teachers in schools of research, not schools of education. And schools they, of research. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they have, they have a very robust model of looking at learning sort of uh, multilaterally. And they draw their teachers from, it, it's such a, it's a noble profession there. And the it teachers is. who are chosen to teach in these cultures, it's, it's an honor. And they and, see it as an honor. And we are making significant progress in the last couple of years, okay? But corporations can only do so much, okay? This initiative is a grow up great initiative is fine. It's terrific. But in the schools, do you sense a, par again, I'm using the word paradigm. You can only use it twice in a show and that's it. Do you sense a significant major paradigm shift in the schools in cooperation with museums, in cooperation with organizations like yours, the shift that needs to take place to say, for our children to grow up great, and for us to play this role and them growing up great, we need to do these things. I see that at the district level. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I at see the that district at level. The district level now and informal STEM, as opposed to when museums would run field trips and workshops, which are great, good to do for kids and, and their teachers. Now we're co-developing a lot of programs specifically with the district's need in mind. And in one instance, we're teaching, we're taking two whole groups of third graders, and we're planning to bring them in each Friday, and they're teachers at the same time. And they're teachers mm -hmm. as well. Teachers are key to the this. The PD and the lab workshops happening in tandem. PD meaning? Professional development for teachers, so that when they leave our museums, uh, the field trips and workshops, we hopefully will give them things to build on that, to, and also to help them anticipate the next trip to the Science Center, to say, when you are back in your classroom, right. revisit this. Uh, giving them some seed ideas and teachers. You know, I, this growing up great grant is it's a fantastic phenomenal. model because it is the co-teaching model of an informal STEM educator, science educator, coming in, teaching side by side with the teacher. And the message the kid gets is extraordinary. Extraordinary because oh, my teacher and this teacher are together helping me understand something. It's a great model. I'm sorry, and the and the museum that model is so effective because you have the museums, you have the subject matter expertise. Of the of the curators of of the paleontologists, like at the state museum, we have actual scientists, paleontologists on site, archaeologists, and teachers are looking for not necessarily fully developed lessons lesson plans and teachers guides at this point. They're looking for discrete video clips and activities that they could do. Like my my fourth grader um, earlier in the year learned a lot about the Lenape Lenape. Mm -hmm. And you know New Jersey's original people. We have a whole archaeological collection related to to those people. So there's a wonderful opportunity there to be a vital resource for teachers across the entire state and and region by by expanding what they're doing in the classroom by enhancing it. That place-based learning. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's and fabulous. It's, it just it's, reinforces it, and then so that those that memory is then ingrained in their long long-term memory. Jump back in. And I, I'm seeing this in the context also of what we're relaying now is these public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. So you're really seeing that beforehand that perspective was much more on a federal or it was on a corporate mm. level. So now you're having public, meaning public school systems or early childhood programs having public-private partnerships. Which, by the way, includes public television. Absolutely. And Sesame, and the Sesame and Workshop's and, connection and, to and PBS. Absolutely. And the thing I think that often was taboo beforehand in early childhood, to bring in media or visual Like prompters, somehow that was less that was, academic. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, less, and so now that's being combined so wisely with, again, as you're describing, teacher development, external experts, and, mm -hmm. or, or people who are interested in those topics coming in directly into classrooms and sharing those experiences with young children, but using media, right. using technology. Exactly. So you're also thinking of 21st century skills. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I want to remind folks, it's a two-part program, the Grow Up Great Initiative. 
we're so proud to be doing it, and I hate to say this, but I have to do it. The second part, we'll talk about math, but I have a feeling it will wind up incorporating many of the same topics. You cannot say well, this is a math show, this is a science show, no, no. this is a technology show. They don't you exist have in to, silos. You have to teach mm -hmm. to teach. Mm -hmm. Meaningful learning is when ah. everything is in grace and everything is in grains. All right, so it's a two-part show with an ongoing dialogue. Ongo ongoing. Does that work? Definitely. <laughs> Good way of putting it. I How much do you love what you do? 20 seconds. How much do you love what you do? I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Just love it. Well, I, 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 my two brothers are attorneys. I'm a teacher. The joke of the family is, wait a minute, you're the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you there. made a great choice, and we made a great choice having all of you. I cannot thank you all enough. Can't wait till part two. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. N13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the PNC Foundation, Fedway Associates, Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, Cohn Resnick, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by PSENG. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. For 17 years, the Russell Berry Foundation has recognized unsung heroes in New Jersey who have done extraordinary things for others. If you know a New Jersey resident whose selfless or heroic actions make them worthy of recognition, you can nominate them to receive the Russell Berry Making a Difference Award. With annual cash prizes of up to $50,000, this award can make a significant difference for a very deserving person. Nominations are accepted online.